Hey now, Fitz Dog here, coming to you from the rainy state, you can't say that often, of California. Uh, Los Angeles in particular, we do not get a lot of rain, and uh, when we do, we kind of can't handle it. It's like, uh, it's like a nuclear holocaust. People hide in their basements. That's a weird thing to call it a... Uh, a nuclear holocaust. It makes it sound like, like the bombs are only killing Jewish people. There's many types of holocausts. Uh, so we had hail the other day, like big pieces of hail. I mean, not as big. I guess like, a, you know, and you go out west and they get, they always talk about the golf ball sized hail. This was, this was pea size, like large peas. Uh, but it was insane. I've been living here for 23 years, and I have never seen hail. I've never seen snow. Um, and, you know, like just north of San Francisco was blanketed in a lot of snow. Um, so it's crazy. I'm going skiing with JoJo tomorrow. We're going to try. I'm going to try to take her up to Mountain High. We used to do that when she was in high school. Sometimes I would surprise her, and I would wake her up for school, and then uh, I would I would steal her and take her off skiing while well, she would snowboard for the day. Those are some of my great memories with her. So we're going to do that. I'm going to steal her tomorrow. We're going to go. Uh, this, this, the conditions are apparently unbelievable. I just got to make sure we can get up there because I don't, I don't know how good they're. Like, they don't know how to handle the roads. They're, they're not used to it. So we got to get uh, have chains. I got to throw those on the car, and uh, may, and bomb up the hill, do some skiing, baby. It's gonna be fun. And it's just like the, the town is just so unprepared. Like everybody's roof leaks because we're just we don't get it, and and our our roofs are baked in the sun year round, dried out, and then it rains, and everyone's just got pots and vases or vases. I think vases, catching water. Nobody's got a raincoat. I saw a lady. <laughs> I saw a lady crossing Main Street in Santa Monica with a uh, dry cleaning bag. You know how they give you the bag for your dry cleaning. She had that over her body, and um, and all the water, it goes out to the ocean they i don't know i it, it, it is a mystery to me we are constantly in a drought and then when it rains the water goes into the sewers and goes straight out to the ocean they don't capture i don't know if they don't capture any of it but they don't capture most of it and uh and so this the ocean is disgusting when it rains because it hasn't rained generally for a month and then all of a sudden you get these torrential storms and all the dog shit and the fertilizer and the exhaust that's settled on the roads. Um, it, it all goes right into the ocean. And you're, you're, you're supposed to stay out of the water for 72 hours. But of course, like usually these storms mean that there's good waves. So all the surfers go out there and the, and the water has like a green foam to it from detergent. And, and there's dukers floating by your head, just pieces of shit floating by your head. And people get bacterial infections all the time, but they go out anyway. Um, so, so we've been staying indoors. Uh, our friends last night had a party. Not a party. There was like 10 of us, and we played that game Celebrity. I don't know if you've played Celebrity, but it's kind of like a charades game. And Erin got drunk, which she doesn't get drunk much. So I love it when she does because she just gets so silly. She gets she gets very uh, fun. She's always fun, but she gets really fun. And uh, And I just... You know, we're sitting. We're I'm sitting across from her, and there's a group of people, and the way she's interacting with everybody, I just, she's just so beautiful. I still find her to be so beautiful, and so genuine. And I just get, I get proud that she's my wife. Sometimes when we're, 
when she's drunk. <laughs> Ironically, when she's drunk, I think is when I love her the most. I don't know about you guys, if you love your spouses when they're drinking. Maybe that's what keeps a lot of marriages together, is that people put down a bottle of wine at dinner. That's That's just to fall in love again. But it was fun, and uh, and then we went over to Gubbins' house yesterday. He had a, he had a new knee put in, Dennis Gubbins, who we talk about a lot on Sunday papers. And we played a gambling game, and it's just fun to see Gubbins, who's normally so hyper, he's just zonked out on Oxycontin and edibles, and we played some gambling games, um, had a fun night. Gibbons came by with his daughter, who's great. She's a great girl. She's a junior in high school, but she's like a, she's got an old soul. Um, what else? Oh, last so last week. I mean, I know I posted stuff. I haven't talked. I don't think I've talked about the birth tour on the podcast. But what a week! Holy shit! Did I have a week last week? I went to. Um, well, first I went. On tour with Bert. And you go down. Now, everything with Bert, I, he makes a lot of money. I mean, the, we played three arenas. There were 15,000 people in each arena. And these people are paying, I don't, I don't know what the tickets are. I'm guessing anywhere from 50 to 150. So say the average ticket is 100. That's $1.5 million, I believe. Is, is my math correct? 1.5 million, but he's spending almost all of it. I'm convinced. It's crazy. We go down to the airport. I think I, did I talk about this? I don't know if I did. Forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but when you get down to this thing, it's like the, a VIP. It's not even part of the airport. It's part of, uh, you go around the block from the airport and then you um, you go in and you can get massages and dinner and then you and you enter the plane from the stairs, from the runway. So they stop the, the the plebes, the peasants, from entering the plane while you walk up the side entrance. You know where they, you know where they, if they over, if they overbook the flight and there's too many bags and they put them down. That's how we came in, where the bags come out, and uh, you know, everything's first class. The treatment is unbelievable. Great catering. Um, Bert bought, we, we were in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and he bought some cigars, and they were like, you know, $50 cigars. He bought like 20 of them, and then we sat outside the camper and smoked at night. It was real nice. Um, there was a trainer there. He's got a personal trainer who is amazing. Her name is Lacey, and she she's just a cool hang, and she's there 24-7 for your workout needs. Uh, although we only worked out once that week, so her job is not that tough. Although I think she's also trying to keep Bert on a diet the whole time. So uh, that was fun. And then we worked out actually in the training facility, the same gym as the Orlando Magic workout in. That's where we worked out. And the uh, and so and we would shower. That's where we would take our showers because you can't shower on the on the tour bus. You have to shower at the arenas. And you can't shit on the tour bus. You do a, if you do have to shit, which you really can't, but if you do, if it's an emergency, you take a plastic bag in there with you and you shit in the bag. And then you, and then I think that gets thrown out the window. It's called a hot bag. I don't know if, I, I think Bert might have hot bagged it once. I don't, I definitely did not. But, and I was traveling with two, two other dudes. That opened are amazing. A guy named Mark Smalls, who I'd never really met before, and uh, he's a he's a good hang. And then my old friend Dave Williamson, who I play golf with, and uh, I used to do shows with in Florida 15 years ago. We're good pals. Uh, he's a big griller. He's a big barbecuer. So follow both those guys. Um, but it was just great. You get you get treated like a star because. Like I would do my set, and first of all, performing in a, in a in an arena is not like performing in a club because it's so big that the laughter kind of gets lost. Like you're doing well, and you can hear the laughs, but it's not like a club where it's intense. So, um, 
So you feel like, all right, I think I did good, but I don't feel like I did great. And then I would walk to the cheap seats. I would walk to the back of the arena, take the elevator upstairs, and then stand in the worst seats. And then people would see me and lose their shit because I was just on the jumbotron. And I was I was a, a, a half an inch big on the stage in their eyes. And now I'm standing there and they're like, you were fucking great. I can't believe it's you. It's like, meanwhile, I come out of a comedy club and people are just like, yeah, good job, man. It's not that big a deal. So it, that was intense. I really enjoyed that. I hate, I, like, I hate to say it because like, I'm not somebody that gets too caught up in people being impressed by me because they're just generally not that impressed. But that, that made me want to go back there every night. And kind of soaked that in. That was fun. Um, and then we went to the Daytona 500. But, I mean, VIP. Bert flew in from Austin and met, uh, no, well, not Bert, Tom Segura flew in from Austin to meet up with Bert because they did a podcast at the Daytona 500. And then we, and then I had my worst nightmare. Literally, a recurring nightmare of mine is being abandoned by everybody. And I'm at the Daytona 500. We're on the track. Literally, I'm touching the steering wheel of, I don't know these guys' names. I don't follow racing, but apparently, the guy who was the favorite, uh, these guys were talking to him. We got introduced to everybody. And we're on the track. We got driven out there on golf carts. And I'm standing there and I'm like, you know, looking at the cars, wow, this is cool. And then I'm like, oh my God, I really got to take a piss. And so I ran off to take a piss. I run back and everybody's gone. They're just gone. And I don't have a ticket to my seat where we're going to watch the uh, race from. I have no idea where we're sitting. And there are a hundred thousand people in the arena, not the arena, the uh, racetrack. And so I'm just looking around and I'm I'm running like like it was like a scene from a movie of of like a, a child losing their parents and everybody's going somewhere because the race is about to start. So people are scurrying. I can't find anybody. And this goes on for 20 minutes. And then I'm like, fuck, what am I? And so I try to call people. But the phone is jammed because there's 100,000 people on their phones. And so there's no service. And somebody told me, oh, yeah, you won't get service for the whole race. So I can't call anybody. And I can't go back to our tour bus because it's parked with about 7,000 other tour buses. You know, they're all they're all just parked around the speedway. I don't even know which direction it's in because we've been driving in golf carts around the place. And and so I'm like, all right, I I guess I'll hitchhike to the Atlanta airport from Daytona to fly back, but I didn't have my wallet. My wallet was on the tour bus. I had about $40 in cash in my pocket and no ID, no credit cards, and I can't find anybody. And I'm like, fuck! And so I take, they had these shuttles. I took this shuttle bus across and then I had to walk underneath the racetrack and then I took another shuttle bus and then I got to the back of the stands and I went to customer service and a very nice lady there Angie was her name she got me on the wi-fi the the track has wi-fi and I was able to text Dave Williamson thank god no I called him I called Dave Williamson and uh, they sent somebody to get me to collect me, which is just embarrassing as an adult to have to be collected and lost. And so we go to this booth, you know, they've got these, uh, these VIP, um, you know, boxes that are glassed in. So you don't have to, so you can actually hear each other talk and they, and, and they've got nice food. They got, they got a whole, apparently this was the, the best luxury box in the arena. We were getting the VIP treatment and it's all celebrities. I'm hanging out with Pete Davidson and Tiffany Haddish and a bunch of rappers. And it was, it was fun. It was a good hang. And then the race was so boring. I wanted to rip my eyes out. Who, who the fuck? I don't get it. I don't get car racing. I got it at the end. 
in the last 45 minutes, they went from just like hanging out to like bumping each other to try to get into the lead. And there were massive crashes. Apparently, this was the longest Daytona 500 in history because there were so many crashes in the last. Because every time they crash, they have to stop down and everybody does like two laps of the track, which is a two mile track. And and you wait while they get all the debris off the field, and then they start again, and then they immediately have another crash. So that part was funny. I enjoyed that. And then we uh, we left we left the field, and uh, we went back to our bus, which was great because we were with all the other uh, race the the other fans, and there was a lot of MAGA hats and American flags. And people sitting around, they made fires. And uh, and so Dave Williamson, who's a character, who lived in an RV for a couple of years, he's like, I'm going to show you what RV life is really like. And so we would just go to campsites, and he would just say hi to people, and we'd strike up a conversation. And we had a very long conversation with this these four couples. <laughs> They'd come from all over the place. And... They were, we started to realize as we talked to them, like they were into some real right wing conspiracy podcasting and, uh, and they were, they were big Christians and all this. And so we, we had a good time talking to them, but they were, they were, you know, from a di- very different world than me. And so then at the end, Dave was like, all right, nice to meet you guys. Uh, don't forget, to check out my website. He's like promoting his website. And I go, and also, I just want to talk to you guys for a minute about the Church of Scientology. And the woman from, on the picnic table st- jumps up and she puts her fingers up like a cross. And she's like, we don't need to hear about that. And they all like freak out. <laughs> and Dave's like, he's just kidding. But they didn't, they didn't believe it was a joke. And we had to leave. It was very funny. Um, so then we left. Uh, we left. I left there. We, t- we did an overnight on the uh, on the bu- on the bus on Bert's bus from Daytona to get to Atlanta. Got to Atlanta, and then I flew to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I met up with like my best friends. Some of my best friends in the world, uh, guys, uh, my roommates from college, who Gibbs has known since high school. And so it was uh, Gibbons, his girlfriend, this other couple, and the other couple. The guy was uh, is a big wig at uh, Columbia Records. He's known Springsteen for twenty years, <laughs> and and his wife uh, Pam, who is a riot, and and so and then Pete Scott from Atlanta, Dudley flew in from. Uh, Wyoming, uh, Jack Stout flew in from another part of Wyoming. Uh, oh no, uh, Duds is in Utah, and uh, Tom O'Neill flew in from L.A. And we all rented a big Airbnb and stocked it up, and uh, we just had the greatest couple days. We we saw Springsteen, who I've been a f- I'm a Springsteen fanatic. I've been a fan since I was. Uh, uh, a young man, a very young man of about 11 or 12. And we took some mushrooms and went to the concert. And it was, I, I probably cried 11 times during the concert. It was so moving, powerful. Fucking band sounded awesome. Big brass section, uh, gospel choir. And uh, and we moved down. We got great seats. We sat. We, we we snuck down to the floor. We were three rows back from the pit, from the mosh pit, and just it was it was amazing. Bruce is the greatest live performer in America today. And you can argue with me. I know a lot of people are going to write to me on social media and say he fucking sucks or Beyonce's better. I don't know who you think is better, but there's nobody better. That dude did a three-hour show at the age of 73. He could have been 24 years old. I'm telling you, this guy has not lost a step. His voice, which which he talked about uh, with, uh, with Howard Stern, is probably at its best right now. He did an encore of about five songs with the lights on. Everybody's on their feet. Um, just, it was, it was incredible. And, and... It was just, it was so weird also being in an arena 
We were in a hockey arena, which is the same thing I was playing with Bert. And I'm standing there going like, I was on the same stage that Bruce is on with the same number of people in the audience. It just seems surreal that 24 hours before I was playing the same size arena as Bruce Springsteen. Um, Obviously not. Those people were not there to see me. They were there to see Bert. But I was still on a stage with that many people. It was weird. Um, So that was a blast. And then... Uh, we just we would stay up all night with, with at the, the uh, at their condo, and uh, and then the next day, we got up and we went to the Bob Dylan Museum, which is in Tulsa. If you ever have a chance to get to Tulsa, great city. I just did some shows there a couple months ago. I or, or I did one show in a theater, and cool people. It's almost like the poor man's Austin, but it's building. I think it's going to be the next very cool city that people live in. Um, they've got a museum dedicated to this massacre that happened to, uh, there was a black community. It was called B- Black Wall Street. It was a very, very um, successful black community at the turn of the 19th century. And then uh, it got wiped out. Might've been in the 1920s. Might've been earlier. Uh, they, they literally torched the town and killed hundreds of people. Um, displaced everybody, um, and there's a museum to that. We didn't make it to that. It was we were going to go, but it was closed. So we went to the Dylan Museum, and uh, it was very weird to change gears and go from Springsteen fanatic to Dylan fanatic. But uh, it's a it's an amazing museum. It's really well laid out, and uh, we had a really nice day there. And then uh, flew home, flew home. So uh, uh, had a great time. Anyway, I don't want to waste too much time. I want to get to my guest. The 1,000th episode of Fitz Dog Radio is coming up. Uh, I have yet to pick a guest for that, but it's going to be around April 1st. I got to get somebody big that's meaningful to the show, maybe a couple people, and do a very special episode. Maybe I'll do a live taping. I don't know. I got to plan it out. That's on my list of things to do. Uh, here, Also, my list of things to do is to come see you people live doing stand-up comedy. I will be in Philadelphia at Helium Comedy Club March 9th through the 11th. I'll be at the Improv in Hollywood for St. Patrick's Day, two shows, March 17th. I will be in St. Louis at the Grandel Theater on April 1st. I will be in Connecticut at the Mohegan Sun Casino April 13th through 15th. Oxnard Levity Live, uh, April 22nd. Escondido, which is around San Diego at the Grand Comedy Club, April 28th and 29th. Columbia, Missouri, the Blue Note, May 19th. Kansas City at the Argosy Casino, May 20th. And Laugh Boston, June 16 through 17. Get your tickets at FitzDog.com. Don't miss it, folks. <laughs> you don't want to miss that. Um, also want to talk to you about the fine people at Factor. Uh, if you've got goals, maybe it's the new year and you've stuck to your nutrition and uh, body positive thinking, uh, fuel up with ready to eat nutritious meals delivered to your door, right to your door. Um, America's number one ready to eat meal kit. You can save so much time. It takes two minutes. You don't put it in the freezer, you put it in the fridge. It's real fast and you will eat. Well, I love it. Uh, sometimes uh, my wife has been working a lot lately. She's a doula and she's got a couple babies. I've been working nonstop. And so I come home and I've got some factor meals in the fridge. I pop those baby in the microwave and we sit in front of the TV and we watch, uh, it's called the, the English, I think it's called. That's what we're binging on. So I don't, I, look, I, I don't have time to go to the grocery store. I don't have time to measure, chop, prep. I don't need any of that stuff. In two minutes, you are done. Uh, they've got all kinds of different choices. You can get keto, uh, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, protein plus options. And the chefs are all dietitians. They're, they're, each meal has all the ingredients you need to satisfy you all day long. Uh, it's clean eating without the hassle. Choose your meals, flavor-packed meals. Um, it's cheaper than takeout. So I don't, I don't know why it's even an option. 
Uh, head to factormeals.com slash FitzDog50, the number 50, and use code FitzDog50 to get 50% off your first box. That's code FitzDog50 at factormeals.com slash FitzDog50 to get 50% off your first box. All right, listen, I'm happily married. I don't want to rub that in your face. So some of you people are looking for that special someone. Uh, the dating apps that you've been going on, you don't like uh, swiping. Uh, you don't like the bad early stages of small talk. And so it's time to meet somebody new. Talkify. T-A-W-K-I-F-Y. That's the funky way they're spelling their company's name. And uh, they, are the, they are the number one modern matchmaking service in the country. And they, uh, they help you get to it in a way that is more productive. Uh, they, they, uh, if it, it, finding a worthwhile connection is difficult. And you, you, uh, you want to feel confident. When you're meeting somebody, and it's easier to do that if uh, if you, if there's been some prep work done. So their their hand their trusted compatibility specialists hand select successful and compelling candidates so you can date consciously and productively. They meet with you, they learn about you, they uh, it's very personalized. They want to know what you're looking for in a partner, and then they select screen potential match candidates for you. They do background checks. They do video interview video interviews. Uh, they ask the kind of questions that are too awkward on a first date for you to ask. And then from there, the matchmaker plans your date introductions, handles all communications for you. They create a safe and stress-free dating experience. They're committed to finding your match. 80% of clients meet their person within the first 12 matches, which is astronomically better than you will do on these other sites. Right now, Talkify is offering our listeners 20% off when you become a client at Talkify, T-A-W-K-I-F-Y dot com slash fits. That's Talkify dot com slash F-I-T-Z for 20% off when you become a client. Talkify dot com slash fits. Do it. Why not? It's 2023. Find your love. Don't waste your time on crappy apps. Do this one. Emmy Award winner, my guest today, he's an Emmy Award winner and a two-time Grammy nominee. Uh, he's got a new tour that he's doing across the country. David Cross, Worst Daddy in the World, 40 Cities, March through May of this year. Check his website and you will find your city on it. You know him from, he was just on... Uh, genius Aretha. He played uh, played uh, who is that? Uh, Wexler, the Wexler producer guy. Uh, he was in Goliath. He was in Steven Spielberg's The Post. He starred in Todd Margaret, which he produced. Uh, he's had a million specials. One of them was named one of the twenty five best stand up comedy specials of all time by Rolling Stone. That one was called The Pride Is Back. He was in Waiting for Guffman. He was in Men in Black, One and Two, Ghost World, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Pitch Perfect Two, um, Kung Fu Panda, Curious George. He go. He started out, he was on the Ben Stiller show. I mean, this is a guy that I started with in Boston, and from the first time I saw him and every time I've seen him, I, I, you just feel like this guy is a notch above. He's a very special, smart, interesting talented dude who's very committed to doing his craft and art he makes it an art um and he's a dear friend uh he's just a just a great dude love talking to him this week he's been on the show many times uh here it is my chat with david cross David Cross joins me now. He came in. It was raining, and it was gray, and it was like, oh, let me turn off this music. Um, music yeah, that doesn't mean anything to anybody outside Southern California. Everybody else will be going like, okay. With the rain? Yeah, or the grayness or whatever. But I mean, but my point being, and then you showed up. Like a, tr a real hero. And the sun broke through literally as I looked out the window and I saw you and I was like, that's so cross. Yeah, I farted. 
Oh, is that what you did? Yeah, it was a. I ripped a good one. So Do you that, eat something so you're in particular to create that? I don't eat. I try not. I. <laughs> that's the thing. I don't eat, and I let the my <laughs> muscle. You know, I start to atrophy, and right. uh, and then my body eats itself, and then. That's just human flesh. Yeah, now I can out. eat again. Wow. Yeah. It's magic. So we were just talking about you did uh, Bert Kreischer's podcast. I just got Yesterday, back from yeah. a, a little bus tour with him in the South. Um, 15,000 seat arenas. Yeah, he was, uh, first of all, he's, I'd never met him before. He was a uh, great, awesome guy. Yeah. And, and after we did a two hour podcast, we talked for another half hour just about, wow. um, he was very adamant, uh, it gave me several reasons, um, and and this this is why I bring it up when you say fifteen thousand seat arenas, uh, to do a podcast. Yeah, he was, he, and I had said I you know I'd been thinking of it. And I think I'm going to do one, and he had lots of advice, very helpful advice, uh, um, coming from both a business and a personal uh, aspect. Right. And, um, you know, it was it was very educational. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, he's got a lot of good advice. He's a guy who's figured out the algorithm of this business, you know, and he did, but he does it in a way that is joyful. He really enjoy like most people oh. when they go like, "Hey, you want to do it? Let, let's shoot a video." Here's oh god, but when he does, it, you're like, "All right, what are we doing?" He's a, he's a great guy, great energy, yeah, uh, just a good dude, you yeah. know. And uh, um, I wish I'd knew known that you were. Uh, doing that tour we would have brought it up yeah and talked about it yeah we had some good stories yeah i'm he, sure he did uh he, we, we went down to uh his high we went to tampa bay where he's from mm -hmm. and uh his local high school that he went to invited him down to like batting practice with the team because he used to play on the baseball team mm -hmm. and of course he rips his shirt off chugs a beer and then hits a home run during <laughs> practice yeah <laughs> well it's high school come on yeah. <laughs> Wait, so you're from uh, you're from what part of Georgia? Uh, just outside of Atlanta. Well, it's yeah. all part of Atlanta now, but it's a suburb. When I was growing up, there was a very rural suburb, uh, Roswell. But now it's all connected. It's all Roswell. one big, massive, sprawling city. Right. Yeah. What uh, did you play any sports? No, I was uh, I not within school, but I was a swimmer. I swam for. Uh, a long time, pretty much no from when I was like five until I was thirteen. I think. Really? Yeah, it was good too. Damn. Yeah, I, I had plenty of. Uh, I would go to junior AAU and invitationals and state uh. and things, and uh, I did pretty well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and our team was really good too. I think we were ranked third in the state too for yeah the years I was on it. Damn. Do yeah. you ever go back and do that now? Swim competitively <laughs> no. you could kick those kids asses now yeah. you would leave them right, move wake. aside six and unders <laughs> make way <laughs> i smoked you <laughs> you're the only one not urinating during the race <laughs> um no i swim a lot i mean um my daughter we we taught our daughter uh uh, well, not we did, but we put her in, you know, swim lessons very, very early on at like six months old, seven yeah. months old. And so she's, she's uh, very much into that. Uh, not the competitive part, but swimming. She loves swimming. And I was, you know, my, as my mom would say, I was a water baby. I was always, you know, a, whatever, a swimming pool, a pond, a lake, a, yeah. a, a, the ocean, whatever. And, um, uh, and still, you know, enjoy it and swim a lot. And we have a we have a place upstate in New York, um, and that is there's a um, we're on the other side of the we're on the New York side of the Del Delaware River, and on the other side, the Pennsylvania side, is the Poconos, famous right. Poconos. So there's all those, you know, vacation uh, areas where there's you can buy houses, but you can get day passes, and they have you know everything you know it's, they're massive and sprawling and they have a really good pool and uh and we go up there all the time yeah and my daughter loves it what's it like at six months i've never seen a six month old swim do they do they pull their head out of the water and breathe or is it just you're well you're really helping them and it's in the very 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 beginning it's just about getting them 
you know, comfortable in the Not water. Not afraid of the water. And you're holding them and you're kind of swishing them back and forth and right. it's popping them up. And then as they get older, uh, then you get into, you know, and they, well, they've got things on uh, and it's right. just about getting them used to it. Right. And, uh, and it's really, it's a slow process, but little by little, you know, you're, they figure out, I mean, she, she could get out of the pool by the time she was like two, really? you know, she was able to pull herself out yeah. and, and that's what they teach the kids. And, and now she's, I mean, she can do, uh, every stroke, but, uh, butterfly, she could sort of do butterfly, but she's not, uh, that good at it, but she's, yeah, she's, she's good. She loves it. Damn. Yeah. That's awesome. And then, and plus, then you can uh, when the baptism comes, it's just there's yeah, so much could, better. Yeah, she can swim water. away yeah. as soon as they start the dunking process. Fuck this shit, I'm out of here. And she can hold her breath, and she can, you know, she take a reed and then grab it and then yeah. blow, <laughs> get air through the reed, and she yeah. can, she can swim half a mile to the to the other side of the Rio Grande and seek asylum in Mexico. Smart kid. <laughs> And the priest is in a speedboat with binoculars. Yeah. We're not going to lose another one. They got sonar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got all that shit done. I got all of my sacraments. Baptism, First Communion, yeah, well, Confirmation. Yeah, she's, she's, uh, she's not any religion. Conveniently, she will accept, uh, gladly accept presents on Hanukkah and Christmas. But nice. She's, uh, um, we haven't raised her with any. She doesn't go to church or synagogue or anything like Are that. Are any of her friends religious? Uh, not to that kind of extent, but she def she has uh, um, one friend, uh, one of her best friends who's across the street um, is Catholic. I don't know how... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how... Um, hardcore they are but uh it, her mom irish catholic dad italian catholic um but w one's brooklyn one's long island and uh and then <laughs> the dad uh they're awesome people i i love their parents we're, we're we're all friends and everything's good but um uh the dad had written a book uh a kid's book uh, um, about Santa, about Santa and Christmas and stuff, and really nicely illustrated. It's pr really beautiful, and I and gave it to us. Like great, this is this is literally like three months ago, and uh, and so I said to my daughter, hey, do you want to if, let's read uh, Liberty's book? It's um, okay, and reading it, <laughs> I had read it, and uh, it's Santa and he's <laughs> getting ready to deliver presents, and then it the very last uh four or five pages it's all about christ and then santa is praying <laughs> literally on his knees no. behind the bed. i swear to god on the but on the side of the bed praying to jesus <laughs> it's santa. I was like, and i'm kind of I'm, I'm avoiding some of the word i'm dropping some of the things and and then you know <laughs> i was like wait a minute you can, Santa Claus is you can't bring those across. two worlds together. They're not allowed to cross beams. No, not at all. <laughs> and uh, and then she she has uh, another friend who's um, her mom is certainly very Christian. If I I drop her off for like play dates, they have a um, Christian the the uh gospel kind of ch but it's not go she's um uh african-american island uh like I, I i don't know what if she's like trinidadian or uh jamaican I i'm not sure but uh so it's that kind of different kind not catholic but that kind of christian right um more of the you know uh dancing and sure. uh, all that stuff and uh and so the kids are certainly being raised with that influence, but it hasn't, you know, it hasn't seeped into Marlowe's uh, world. Really. Yeah. Doesn't mean anything, really. Yeah. It is good that they get exposed to it, though. I mean, my, my daughter and son went to uh, Spanish immersion school, so they had a lot of Latino kids. And my mm -hmm. daughter got very fixated on the kind of like... 
macabre side of it. She went sure. dark on it. Well, d- did uh, um, was there Day of the Dead? Yeah, uh, stuff. Yeah. yeah, my my daughter loved that. Yeah, loved it. She has a, another very good friend, um, and uh, and they celebrate that. And it was yeah. a thing. They ever all the kids came over and they painted the skulls and yeah. uh, had the whatever the thing they the bake and, uh, and, and, and oh, eat yeah, yeah. and right, stuff. Right. Um, <clears throat> the uh, and uh, oh, she loved it. She's way into that macabre stuff. Yeah, you know, she loves the idea of her favorite place. Um, her, her favorite place to go is uh, cemeteries, and uh, just I don't know, a uh, week and a half ago, we were in Brooklyn. We were coming back uh, from a um, her friend's birthday party, a- and in uh, in. Uh, Sunset Park in Brooklyn, and and have you ever been to uh, Greenwood Cemetery in, no. in Brooklyn? It's beautiful, old. I mean, rolling hills yeah. and all kinds of cool stuff. And um, and I was like, hey, you want to go to the cemetery in the way? Which yeah, we spent over an hour, and she's you know, and she, uh, anytime we do go to a cemetery, she'll ask me to find the youngest people who died, the kids. <laughs> And then and then read them the really read, read her the the particulars yeah wow. she's way into that that's interesting and she said this is actually in my uh, in my current set uh, but she said this is absolutely hundred percent true um, and we were talking about anything we were having breakfast and it was just me and her my uh, wife was out of town and she just after a little pause she went daddy I'm sad you're going to die soon. <laughs> Like wow, <laughs> I know she's into that stuff, but okay, maybe she knows something I don't. No, no, no. My friend sent me this video. He was at a, he was at a cemetery recently, and uh, a guy who died. He was a big sports fan, and his grave is like concave. It's there's a mm-hmm. setback, and there's a radio on, and it's on sports radio. And every seven days, the caretakers have to replace the batteries and keep sports radio playing for this guy all the time. Nobody told them that he's dead? <laughs> That's t- what a terrible waste. I know you don't need the he's new batteries. Dead. No, His you batteries don't need. are gone he's not going to know. Yeah. Oh, that ship has sailed, yeah. my yes. friends. Yeah. Meanwhile, you got other people trying to like listen to listen to like you know sit at their mother's gravestone. Right. And you got to listen to Mad Dog. Yeah, you got to listen to guy. It, I mean, they've got how is Lamar Jackson not going to go? This is crazy. <laughs> yeah, full full force. <laughs> oh boy. Oh my God. So so anyway, I wanted to ask you about touring because you got a tour coming up. Mm-hmm. I'll read the dates a little bit later, but. We got to reward people for listening to the whole podcast by getting the date. And I'll do the dates now. Yeah, fuck that. Do the dates now. Do the dates now, because who knows how many people are going to bail? We say <laughs> we say the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, this starts. This is your tour, and it's called what's this one? I'm a bad dad tour, the worst dad in the world tour. Um, well, both of those uh, things you just came up with are inferior to what it's really <laughs> called, which is. Uh, worst daddy in the world. Worst tour. daddy in the world tour. Yeah. It starts March. I, how? What kind of? Would you go see a show called "I'm a Bad Dad"? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds terrible. Uh, March second in Portland, Oregon. March third in Seattle. March fourth in Vancouver. Oh, don't the, go through all the day. There's a Albany, Tarrytown, New York, my hometown, where I grew up. You're gonna be at the music really? hall. Oh yeah, I it's a beautiful that. old theater. It was built in like 1870. Awesome. I've never played there before. Yeah, some of these are new. Some of these places, but let me let me. Uh, 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 sorry to interrupt. Just to, yeah. just to you know condense this stuff. So this is the first. There's 40 dates on there. This is the first leg. We're about to yeah. announce the second leg. There'll probably be three in total. Um, and go to officialdavidcross.com, my website. That'll have all the information. But uh, so the first 40 dates are on there. There'll be more coming up, and uh, it eventually get the rest of the u.s and the rest of canada and then europe will be in there wow buffalo iowa city omaha englewood colorado phoenix sacramento san francisco los angeles at the palace theater that's a nice spot Mm -hmm. san diego austin texas you gonna uh stop in and do the rogan show while you're there uh i don't know if i have time that hasn't been scheduled so i don't know 
uh, Houston, Dallas, New Orleans, St. Louis, Chicago, Knoxville, Tennessee, Columbia, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. Now, I notice you're not playing New York City on this tour. I am. The second leg. Oh, the second We're, leg. Uh, I'm going to do a show. I think it's going to be Webster Hall. Okay. And I'm going to make it a bit of an extravaganza. Uh, and I'm, I'll have, like, lots of special guests and stuff. Um, it'll kind? be it. I mean, you know, friends of mine that I'll, I'll, you know, if they're in town, I'll have them yeah. drop by. You know, nice. Make sure, uh, I'm sure Bob will be there if he's in town. Uh huh. Um, Any musicians? Yeah. You're friends with, uh, I remember you're friends with the Strokes. Yeah. We'll see. I'm not saying yeah. anything. It'll be a <laughs> fun night. Um, what about LA? You going to bring out some friends in LA? Yeah. I'm, if, again, if Bob's here, I'll definitely yeah. ask him. And we have this thing that we've been doing. We just did this benefit, uh, like, I don't know, a week and a half ago in New York at Joe's Pub, uh, something that my wife had uh, was involved with. And uh, it's this thing we did a couple, we've only done it a couple of times, so it's really, 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 really fun to do. And it's where we we go, hey, you know, we this is normally, you know, uh, this is our night to pitch each other, and we, we do this every night, whatever the time is, if Wednesday at 10.30 or whatever, whatever show we're, the time is of the show we're doing. And, um, and so, you know, David will pitch me ideas and, and I'll pitch David ideas and, and, um, and, but it's really important to us and we don't want to uh, mess it up. So we'll just do it now if that's okay with y'all. And it's great. I and then it. we, we write <laughs> like literally an hour or so before we go up, we each write like five things on a piece of paper, fold it up and then give it to the other person to read as if it was their pitch. <laughs> and it cl it's not tricking the audience. The audience can s clearly yeah. see. We make a point that they know that I wrote the things that I'm giving them yeah. up, and then he has to pitch this oh, idea. Oh, that's such a great idea. It's so much fun, and yeah. uh, and it's really hard not to laugh. And the, Hopefully you don't laugh, but I'm, I mean, I'm constantly laughing. <laughs> Do you remember what you pitched at Joe's Pub? Oh, fuck no. I mean, uh... uh I do remember that there's a lot of silly stuff and there's some puns involved, you know. Uh, I don't remember, but I know that the last thing I pitched was the literal uh, plot line to the... And I said, it's called... This is called The Banshees of uh, Inisharan. And uh, it's about a guy who doesn't want to hang out with another guy, um, but the other guy doesn't understand why. So then the other guy cuts off all his fingers and throws them at his door. I, I'm like, trust me, it's a good movie. It doesn't makes no sense on paper or when you're watching it. But <laughs> did you see that movie? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Uh, well, I'm Irish. I'm 99% Irish, and so, so there's so like what? there's something in my DNA that just responds to like the cinematography and the accents. Oh, and it's I just go no, all it's in. beautiful. I it's love an it. island off yeah. the coast. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. well acted. Certainly well acted. Yeah, the sister was amazing. Yeah, they're all good. The, yeah. the four main players were great. Yeah. Uh, uh, but <laughs> I'm like, what? This I, When it was over, I'm like, that felt like it was supposed to be about something and make yeah. a statement, but it did not yeah. at all. And a lot of people, I'm sure, were like, that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. It's a contemplation on what? No, it wasn't. Right, right. It was an interesting idea that doesn't mean a fucking thing. <laughs> and I enjoyed I enjoyed watching it. But at, when it was over, I was like, fuck this. This is, come on. You guys. What? This? So the guy cuts off his. Yeah, what? Right, right. And then. Yeah. And then the end is supposed to mean something when the dog is out on the beat. Like, what? Come on. And he stop it. When, when he torched the house, I went like, "All right, we we were drinking when we wrote Act Three here." <laughs> it was what the fuck? Yeah, it, it, it was. I want somebody to explain it to me. Yeah. I want somebody who loved that movie, who got the uh, subtext and the messages right. and the metaphors. Yeah, uh, I want them to explain what the movie I mean was. what I liked was that you don't see friendship examined as much as romance and it was kind of refreshing to have a movie that was not about a romance I mean just you... sure but it was also it's it's not about I mean it's just I guess it's 
it, it would certainly be different if it took place in a cosmopolitan city. The idea that there are very few people on here and this guy's like, I don't want to hang out with you anymore because he's trying to finish this this musical piece, yeah. which we discover a little bit later after he says, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. Why? I just don't. You have got nothing to say and you bother me. Yeah. Uh, but then it doesn't. It, then it's, I guess, about need and about. Uh, but it's not. Yeah. It's not really. Yeah. It's just a thing. We see that, but it's not about and you're that. Kind of going the whole time. Does this guy have intellectual disabilities here? Like, you, they, he, he's right on the edge of it. You're not really sure how he'd be classified if he was in New York going to a good yeah. therapist. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was a, yeah. Yeah. But I am, uh, and then also the, idea that they could see and hear the civil war that was happening you know the um the troubles in ireland yeah the, no it wasn't the troubles it was oh, a, it was, was uh yeah. it was uh current no no the troubles were later this was uh when it was uh the the 20s when ireland was come on oh, mr irish oh right it was you the know, irish uh, revolution 1917 yeah. Yeah, well, went into the early twenties, but right. yes, so so it was about that. Yeah, um, and I and that seemed to mean something uh, that I did also did that that meant something to us as we were watching the the you know this play out on the small island. But well, I don't one, even know what that was. One thing that I read was that him chopping off his five fingers was the. Um, the uh, five counties of Ireland in the south, that, in the north, that were... Um... How the fuck am I supposed to know that? <laughs> How the motherfuck am I supposed to know that? There is dairy. <laughs> there is, yeah, yeah. That was going deep. That was people really searching hard for I something. Guess. Yeah. So I want to ask you about tour buses because I'd never been on one before, and it was yeah, man, it was miserable. I I don't really know. oh, I dude, mean, I have uh, okay, go ahead, finish. I mean, I was just gonna say I love when I'm locked into my bed and it's dark and it's and the and the bus is moving and you fall asleep yeah, like that, yeah. but the waking up on a tour bus was the most unpleasant. It was the most disorienting thing. I didn't know where I was, what time it was, who was up. And yeah. I was new to it. These guys have all been touring together for right. years. So I was like, am I holding people up? Or are they waiting for me? Or So you get up, and then you're the first one up. And, um, you know, your clothes are all under the fucking bus, so you can never access anything. Showering in, a, in an arena. Yeah. Well, you know, so, you, so y'all foot. didn't have um, overnight hotels or anything? Was no, this, it was no. just the bus. All right, I... On this tour, I'm doing this uh, this way for the first time ever because my daughter's in school. This is I, I don't want to be at, out on the road um, too long. Normally, uh, I would, and I'd be able to um, afford it this way too, where I'd go out on the road for four months, right? Four four to five months, and that's pretty much it. I'm out like on the road straight. Straight, you know, a couple, a couple, uh, a couple of days, you know, a couple, of, uh, the ability to go home here and there, uh, but mostly, you're, you're on the road, yeah, and, uh, and the last tour I went on, uh, we had a, a little crib, a pack and play, uh, drilled into and set into the, the back of the, oh, nice tour bus, and. Um, so my daughter and we had a nanny and my wife was also doing had a book release at the same time. So, oh, that's right. So she was able to um, you know piggyback and and do bookstores and uh, um, so most of the family was out there and it was great and and I've been on a bus the last couple times but this tour because I don't I I don't want to be away from my family that long uh, I'm breaking it up into like I'm out for you know, five days and then back for mostly doing weekends, like Thursday, Friday, Saturday shows, um, sometimes Sunday, whatever. But uh, then I'm back home to be able to help out and just be there, you know, cause she's in school and stuff and, uh, um, and not be away for so long. So there's no bus. I can't afford to have a bus hanging out when I'm not using it. Right. Know? Oh, it only makes sense if you're really on it full time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and it's great. And so this new schedule, 
I was telling my wife, I mean, I'm, it's going to be really fucking hard because there's a lot of these places, there's no direct flight, and it's, you can't fly in. Some of them I can fly in day of, uh, especially if I'm going west, east to west. But west to east, you have to fly in the day before. Yeah. You have to, in order to make sure you're there, and there's only a handful of flights, and you're still going to have to make a connection. To get to Iowa City is a fucking nightmare. I yeah. think you have to go... You have to, like, fly into... Oh, from Buffalo. Yeah. You go to either Chicago, and then it's a four-hour drive, or you go into Cedar Rapids, and then someplace else, or someplace else, then to Cedar Rapids, and then you drive for... It's... And then you have to get up, uh, you know, you have to take, like, a 9.45. That's the latest flight you can get, which means you've got to get up at 7 after a show. And I do... I'll do two hours, you know, yeah. and uh, and then I'm having like meet and greet stuff afterwards. And, I, you know, I the idea of being able to do those shows, hop on a bus, somebody else, I wake up and I'm in the town. Yeah. As opposed to getting, you know, really disconcerting to wake up, especially when you're like on week two of 14 weeks and you're like, Every hotel room looks the same. You yeah. don't know where the fuck you are. And you're yeah. like, where am I going? What do I do? And, you know, your alarm rings on your phone. You're like, huh? Okay. Hey, uh, get a cup of coffee. Wash your face. Brush your teeth. Put your clothes on. Uh, put your kit back together. Go down the lobby. Get in a car, a cab. Go to the airport. Go through. I mean, it's that's going to be a bummer. Yeah. It's going to be tough. And I'm really missing the bus. Are you going to drive some of the dates? Yeah. Yeah. And who you got? Is it Sean Patton again? Sean, uh, well, Sean did. Yeah, I had to cancel that. Uh, I had to cancel that tour. Sean was originally supposed to go out with me with uh, what was going to be the uh, Elegance Redefined tour, which turned into I'm from the Future. I just taped a special in New York. Right. Uh, but we had to stop. You know, we we canceled it because of COVID, and uh, and so Sean is out with me on all the dates this this time. Yeah, and he's great. You yeah. know Sean, right? Oh, yeah. yeah Sean's he's, hilarious. He's great. And he's the perfect, he's the right guy to open the Breaks show. Breaks down some doors and for he's, you. He's, and the energy and yeah. the style is just mm-hmm. perfect. Yeah. And so is it who's on who's on the crew? Is it just you and him? And you have a tour manager with you as well? Yeah, I'll have a tour manager. And then it's just me and him, yeah. That's it. That's it. Tight. Well, there's no, uh, I don't have any, you know, I don't have any plants in the audience or, uh, you know, PowerPoint presentations yeah. or anything like that so well f- some people travel now with like a full-time video person because they're making clips for the internet every day Bert- yeah i'm I, I that's something burton i you know again he was he had so much helpful advice yeah. and uh and you know after talking initially then doing two hours of the podcast then we talked for like another half hour yeah uh him and his wife were very uh you know just he gave me lots and lots and lots of advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then you see so you guys will fly, you'll drive, and then you'll stay in hotels, and then you'll come home for a couple of days at a time, mm-hmm. and then uh, and then the the material is stuff that you've worked out in like Brooklyn places and. Yeah, I did something this time that I I hadn't done before. It was actually my wife's idea, and it was great. Um, you know, normally when I get these things. Uh, together i have the you know i'm very lucky i have the the luxury of just all these great places to work material out literally i either i can walk there or just ride my bike right like i don't even there's a handful that i'll they'll do in manhattan i'll take the subway whatever yeah that's five stops right um but mostly i can walk there or just hop on my bike and get there and um which are the places m- the the places i most uh, like bell house Bell House, yeah, that's yeah. where I actually taped the special. The I'm from the future, but um, uh, Union Hall, oh, yeah. and then I when I get a little bigger, it's like Union Hall and Sultan Room in Bushwick, uh-huh. which is a great room. I, if you are out there, they're just they're great. Yeah, um, Union Hall, Sultan Room, and then when it gets a little bit bigger, Littlefield, and then Bell House when I'm 
got like, okay, this is it. I just need to work on sequencing and I'm, this is it. I'm ready to go. Yeah. And, you know, um, and the other ones, the crowds are showing up knowing that you're kind of workshopping material. Yeah. I mean, point. it's called, uh, and I've been doing this for years and years. I did the last, it's the last three, uh, specials were, or tours, I should say, but, um, shooting the shit, seeing what sticks. So I do that. But this year, I did something different, and it was a uh, uh, it was really smart, and and it, again, it was my wife's idea. I just I went when it was pretty much set. I had a lot of stuff, and I went and did a bunch of music venues, which is what I used to do, you know, smaller uh, venues, but not comedy clubs, not comedy rooms. And I did two nights, and I went to like Portland, Seattle, uh, Denver, Austin you know, like 12 places, something like that. And then worked out the material there. Um, and it was really helpful. It was really good. Salt Lake City. That's where I'm going to shoot the special. Yeah. When I, when I shoot oh, really? It. I'm going to shoot it in Salt Lake City. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I always have great shows there. Yeah. And they're really uh, generous, excited, no, uh, comics appreciative love Salt Lake City. crowd. Yeah. They love it. It's just so funny because people's first take on Salt Lake City is it's all Mormons and it's going to be conservative. But... Well, that's the thing. It's not all Mormons. Right. And the ones who aren't, it's mostly Mormons. And the ones who aren't Mormons are like, thank God yeah, you're yeah. here. Thank you so much right. for coming. And uh, and I also have a lot of uh, material that I don't do anywhere else, but I do in Salt Lake City about Mormonism and the history of Mormonism oh, and stuff like great. that. So there was a whole thing last uh, two tours ago where... Or no, it was, a, it was the Okamon tour where uh, I did a little ad, like a meme thing uh, uh, that I put on social media where it's uh, it was a Tobias thing that's kind of uh, well-known where it's uh, I've got a bathing suit over my uh, cut-off jeans and I'm like, uh, do these effectively hide my thunder? And it was it's like a meme that's out there. Uh -huh. And we Photoshopped uh, the sacred undergarments uh, oh, over yeah, that yeah. picture and people freaked the fuck out and it made the it made international news at one point but it was uh, locally it was a big deal I, eventually uh the secret service was so people were really angry sent a couple people to show and because i was doing anti-trump stuff um kind of violent fantasies <laughs> um uh they called the Secret Service. I had to meet with the Secret Service uh, wow. to see if I was a credible threat. Yeah. And that's a serious thing. You, sure. There's no like, um, all right, I'll meet you on Thursday at four if I can. You yeah, know, like you got to meet with the Secret Service right. and I had to have a lawyer and um, Damn. all this crazy shit. But that was because of Salt Lake City. You Damn. Um, so you work it out at these clubs, you build it up, mm -hmm. and then you, and then you, and then I imagine you're still, in the early dates, are still like really locking it down. Still well, finding yes, stuff. yes and no. I mean, I'm always still finding stuff, and it's the reason that I've always, uh, literally every time, I will tape the special uh, in the middle of the run, and then I will tape the audio version at the end because oh. and then the audio if you go to any of my specials in the attendant you know cd excuse me um there it'll say like you know 33 percent different material or something wow. like that. so there's always different material because the show evolves and grows and 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 things happen uh, so many bits that uh i've done over the years are things that happened to me while i was on tour right you know, and uh, and they become their own bits, and uh, um, or a bit that is received differently in a different part of the country, and then I talk about that, and then I just sort of stumble upon like, oh, there's this bigger thing here, and I can turn this into a bit. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, or fold this other bit into this idea. So it's always evolving. I mean, that's that's kind of the nature of of what I do, for better or worse. But um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I've got too much material, way, way too much. I mean, well, if I've you're been, doing two hours and then you're making it a one hour special, that's a lot of editing. Yeah. And I, I don't want to make it two hours, especially cause I have an opener. I'm always looking for 75 minutes. I'm looking for an hour and 15 with, uh, stuff for an encore, 
you know, yeah. things that I can go, okay, I didn't do this. I'm going to do this in the encore. Um, and so I've been trying to get to an hour and 15 and these like kind of last tune up shows. And I mean, there's entire chunks that are huge bits that are, I like, haven't gotten to and I've already cut a bunch of stuff. So well, well that seems like that's where you would have your video guy on the road shooting that stuff and so put it putting it out separately yeah but maybe i'm uh, perhaps i'm being too precious about it mm -hmm. but i want to save it right and i and one of it's almost like um sourdough sourdough bread where every time i go out i get enough material that i don't release it on on the special that I can then go and do. And so I'm not starting from scratch. I haven't started from scratch in 20 years. I mean, I have the stuff that I'm cutting for time and maybe it doesn't, fl it messes up the flow and I'm getting a really nice flow. And, um, and I, so I'll take this bit, even though I love it and I'll go next time I go out, I'll do that bit. Right. I have a whole, one of my favorite, oh, I could go into here, but, um, I have a bit that has been, I've cut like three specials in a row that I, I love to do and I don't want to burn it because uh -huh. I so enjoy doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh. Well, you know, you look at like Jay Leno never put out a one hour special because he felt like he never wanted to give it away. Mm -hmm. He just always felt like he's almost like the old Catskills comedians where it's like you had the act mm -hmm. and you worked on it and. You know, and it's kind of a shame because, like, Leno's early stuff, I don't, I don't really know what his stand-up is like now, but, I mean, I used to go see him when I was a teenager, and he was the fucking greatest. He's, mm -hmm. He was so goddamn good, and none of that's none of that's been preserved because he just never right. did specials. I Well, I mean, I, I get it, you know? I mean, I love, I, 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 I love the set and i want people to see it but i also love doing that set yeah and i want to be able to do it and not flush uh, it and not yeah because I, I people don't um uh realize i mean they do eventually understand it but the, but it's just not in the you know the understanding that once you once that stuff airs it's not like music or anything else. Yeah. Once it airs, it's done. That's yeah, it. Joke right. is never going to be told again. Right. Never, never, never. And yeah. there are some bits that have this kind of little ride to them where, you know, uh, especially with my kind of stuff that's more button pushing where I'm like teeing up the, the, the premise and then get to that punchline that makes people go, oh, man. <laughs> I can't believe he said that, you know, and, and yeah. you miss those, yeah. you know, 1400 people going, Oh shit. You right. Know? Right. Right. It's a, it's a fun thing yeah. to experience. I just watched uh Marin special last night. Have you seen oh, it? I haven't. I, yeah. I will. When I get home, how, how is it's how great. Is it? It's yeah, great. And I'm you sure know, my, my wife who, uh, we have very different senses of humor. She really finds stuff funny that I don't find funny at all. And she does not think, that I'm funny, like not not that like she thinks I'm funny <laughs> right. around the house, right. but like when I when I say to her, yeah, I'm thinking about this bit. What do you think? She was like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> that's that's inappropriate or whatever. She just, did. but she was fucking dying during Marin's set. And yeah, I want to see it. It's a slow build. I mean, he comes out and he does some stuff that's a little conceptual and 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 slow, and he. I mean, he really is a one-hour comedian. Marin mm -hmm. is a guy that's better seen in, in, in an hour than in 15 minutes at a For club. For sure, yeah. And so the first 10 minutes is like, okay, I, I, I don't know if this, if this is going well. And then all of a sudden, like, he gets into this groove, and he's just like uh, talking about, obviously, his uh, Lynn dying. Right, right. And he handles it in a very, uh, very raw, funny way. And well, that's he, what he's best at. Yeah, know? yeah. That's his. That's one of his innate skills. Yeah, yeah. And he talks about does some great abortion stuff, and uh, it was good. It was very good. Um, I, I, I mean, it's it's on HBO. It's on HBO. So. Yeah, from bleak to dark. Bleak to dark. Yeah. Right. I, I will. Def I'm looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously out on out here doing this, but uh, you know, in the 72 hours 
I've free I've got until this yeah. <laughs> stuff starts. Right. I will definitely watch it. Yeah. Um, wait, Marin was Marin was part of the cross comedy thing back in Boston, right? Yeah, he in in a in a uh, he wasn't like part of the the cast as it were, but he was uh, instrumental, uh, very instrumental in actually getting the whole thing together. He was he, you know, remember Robin Horton who booked Robin Cash. Horton, of yeah. course, yeah. Um, but Mark was uh, Mark was very helpful and uh, um, you know uh, encouraging about it and. Uh, and you know it was it was in no small part he was a big part of getting that thing off the ground and yeah getting it to happen yeah right and that was um yeah that, that it was uh john john benjamin john was benjamin a big part of it uh john benjamin helene lantry lauren dabrowski who's passed unfortunately um carrie prusa john ennis uh, Grant Jim, Taylor, Jim De, Grant Taylor, Jim DeCroto, who passed as well. Uh, um, Paul Kozlowski, yeah, Crescino, Crescino, uh, right? Uh, uh, Ed, uh, Ed Doherty, not Ed Doherty, uh, Ed uh, Driscoll. Um, Garofalo would stop in sometimes, right? Oh yeah, uh, uh, Chuck Chuck Sklar, yeah, um, yeah. Jonathan of, Groff do it at all? Oh yeah, Jonathan Groff, absolutely. Uh-huh. And people that went on to have like pretty illustrious careers. Yeah, not just crazy. as performers, but as writers. You know, John well, Groff John, is one of was, the biggest showrunners in Hollywood. Yeah, right he now. was head writer for Conan for a long, long, long time. Yeah. Lauren Dabrowski was the head writer producer for Mad TV. Right. Um, oh, Sam Cedar also. Sam Cedar. Sam Cedar was a big part of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was pretty, pretty crazy. Damn. Eclectic. Uh, talented group, that's for sure. Yeah, it was an exciting thing because, uh, just to put it in perspective, if you were a Boston comedian in the late 80s, early 90s, it was, the clubs were hardcore. It was, it, it was very <laughs> yeah. aggressive. It was very, very, uh, a lot of testosterone. Yeah, yeah. there was a lot of testosterone. <laughs> I mean, Kevin Knox, who was like kind of the, one of the leaders, he came out in a sweatsuit. Sweatsuit. And he had this mane of golden locks in a mullet. And everyone's partying. Everyone's coked up, yeah. or drunk. <laughs> and uh, and Kevin Knox had a joke that I used as uh, I did w- one of the one of the albums I did um, early early ones. All the it might have been Shut Up You Fucking Baby. Actually, uh, it was very early, it was an early album had. All the titles to the things were bad jokes, like bad premise jokes that were popular back then. And yeah. one of them is if baseballs had AIDS on them. <laughs> and that's from Kevin Knox's <laughs> joke about in the 86 World, Se- uh, 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 World Series, you know, the famous Bill Buckner yeah. muffin the ball down the first base line. Like, hey, how come uh, this is one of his classic Killer bits. Hey, you know why uh, Bill Buckner didn't uh, didn't uh, didn't uh, uh, catch that ball? He heard it at AIDS on it. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's and people would go nuts. The king. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. You Noxie. know. You know, you know what AIDS. You know what AIDS stands for? Adios, infected, infected dick suckers. suckers. And the crowd oh, would go, "Wow!" God. Adios, infected dick suckers. <sighs> That's right. Yeah. And he and he would have a towel on his shoulder because he'd be sweating through the set, and uh, so so out of you, this. You played Knicks, right? Did oh you play fuck Knicks? Yeah. yeah! I mean, that, I was sort of in both worlds because, like, I was. Yeah, there I were a handful of you guys. There were there were uh, Marin was one. Yeah, Louis. Yeah, Louis was in both worlds. Um, Kozlowski and, and Janine actually did the clubs. I mean, to her credit, people don't understand that Janine Garofalo is a club comic. Like, she understands how well, to we do... Well, we all started... Th- this kind of thing that's... Uh, I mean, that didn't... That wasn't around until we were all doing it. Right. But that... Yeah, everybody cut their teeth in the clubs. Yeah, yeah. That's, and, that's what was there. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I remember, do, like, Kozlowski one time, we, we went up to New Hampshire... And we were doing a sports bar that Bill Downs used to book. Sure, of course. And Bill Downs used to uh, not pay people, and then, and then when <laughs> That's he would putting it politely, and then when you would track him <laughs> down, he would pay you pennies on the dollar. Like it, like, so they started calling him Potter oh, from It's a Wonderful dude. Life. 
Paul Barclay and uh, it was it was Bill Downs Bill, and Paul Barclay. Yeah, right? yeah, they were partners. Uh, yeah, and they would kind of blatantly rip you off. Oh yeah, like there wasn't a there wasn't a whole lot of <laughs> there was no winking nuance. or anything. Yeah, yeah. It was no nuance, and yeah. they just would tell you, yeah, like, yeah, we had it. You'd go into their office feeling like you're 12 years old. Yeah. Getting, looking for the money that you deserve. There's nothing you shouldn't be sheepish about it. Right. And you're like, uh, "Hey, Bill. Uh, so yeah, I didn't. Um, that you, you had told. Sorry, but you had told. And it's all ca- it's cash under yeah. the table. It's all cash. And uh, you t- you had said uh, you had said forty five dollars, uh, and this is twenty, and. <laughs> For this for this gig, the one the one in Rutland, Vermont, and uh, <laughs> the one I drove four <laughs> yeah, hours to yeah, exactly. with no hotel room. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, kid, I don't know what to tell you. You know, uh, things are tough. Things are tight now. Uh, we're gonna get it to you. Oh well, I uh, I have to I have to pay uh, I have to pay. I have no more plasma to give, so uh, and it's start winter setting in. <laughs> Yeah, kid. Oh, it's tough for all of us. You know. Oh, hang on, kid. Let me tighten up. Oh, things are tough for all. <laughs> he once, uh, I once went to a gig. And, well, it gets to the Kozlowski thing, but like, I, I did a gig for Paul, and it was a uh, one nighter. And he would, not Paul, Bill Downs. And he was there, and he owed me, he owed me like $3,000, which back then Whoa. was a lot of gigs. I had done a lot of gigs. And so wow, was, that that's a that's a lot of. And he, I mean, we were getting oh, fifty to hundred bucks a set. Yeah, yeah. So I go before I get on. I go, Bill. Shit, I forgot my watch. I don't want to go long. Can I borrow your watch while I'm on stage? So he gives me his gold watch, and I do my set, and this, then I fucking duck out the back door. That's brilliant. And then I drive home, and I get a call the next that's day. That's fucking. Hey, brilliant, pal. Man. Remember everything was pal. Hey, pal. Yeah. Uh, you you forgot to give me my watch back there last night, pal. And I was like, "No, Bill, you forgot. And not Bill, you forgot to give me three thousand dollars." That's beautiful, Greg. That's great. So he met me at a Dunkin' Donuts, and I said, "Do not bring a check. I want cash. Yeah, yeah. I want all the fucking money." I go, "I know this watch is worth more than three thousand dollars." That's I got, really and I got smart. The cash. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. And you, you had planned that, right? Is oh that... no! Well, I saw the gold watch in his wrist at the club, and I went, "Oh, oh. meaning that was uh, something you yeah, came yeah, up with yeah. right there." Yeah. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. I and and then and then when uh, Kenny Rogers and I told him the story and he goes, because uh, Bill Bill had all the '80s accoutrements of wealth. He had the cocaine, he had the Mercedes, oh, yeah, yeah. and he adopted Asian babies. And yeah. so Kenny's like, <laughs> "I'm stealing one of those fucking Chinese kids. That's how I'm getting my money back." <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a great story. But uh, so then the uh, Kozlowski gig, we were at like uh, Bill Rick in 99, like a sports mm-hmm. bar in New Hampshire. I remember that one. And so uh, so the, it was it was the playoffs and mm-hmm. the uh, Red Sox are in the playoffs. And so they refused to turn the TVs off during the comedy show. Of course. So Paul's on stage and the TV is behind the stage. And so they're looking past us during the show. And I go up and I bomb, and somebody goes up and they bomb, and then Paul goes up, and he pulls the remote control out of his back pocket during his set, and he would he would he would start announcing the game. He would go, "Oh, it looks like uh, you know Buckner's got a single. He's gonna make." And then just as he was about to get to first base, and the throw was in the air, he would turn off the power, and they'd wow. fucking go, "Fuck you!" That's and then pretty he'd turn ballsy. Turn it back on again. And he kept turning it on that and off is ballsy. until they finally like got up on stage and they threw him off the stage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, yeah. What's the point of having stand-ups in front of a, a yeah. show that people are watching or, right. or a TV? event that people are watching yeah um so let's get to uh my favorite segment of the show whenever i have a stand-up comedian on i ask them the same three questions okay have you ever not finished a set uh yeah yeah i know one was in uh at the kilkenny festival in the comedy festival in ireland and I just was like, uh, this is stupid. I wasn't, it wasn't even like I was angry. It was like, this is, it kind of like being in front of the sports thing. It's like, yeah, this is stupid. It's the, why wasn't it going well? Um, part of it was me for sure. I was, uh, 
uh, the first three sets I had there were not good. And I think I was, uh, not I think, I know I was over thinking it and, and trying to do material that I thought an Irish audience would like at a comedy festival, you know, small town, whatever. And, uh, and my girlfriend at the time, uh, who was there with me was just like, just do what you do. You know, don't think, don't sweat it. Don't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, easier said than done, but she was right. And then I, and then I had good sets after that. Uh, but the, that was like the apex of the bad sets. It was under, it was at some like disco y type place underground, no windows. It was all kind of closed. Uh, smoking ban hadn't taken effect yet. Yeah. And, uh, it was, people were just yelling shit, just uh-huh. yelling. And so it was, it was where I was trying, but I was like, this is stupid. Yeah. Um, just get somebody else up there. And then uh uh and then I remember after me, Daniel Kitson, who's a genius. I won't say that about too many people, but uh, He's an Irish comic? English. Uh uh-huh. went up and just had a meeting out of it. It didn't try, uh, it didn't it's just effortless. Dude, effortless. what is worse than that? The only effortless. thing you want when you're licking your 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 your, your yeah. wounds off stage is the next, the next guy to bomb. bomb. Oh, they loved him. Oh my god. And he's great. He's a charming guy. He was he just sort of laughed it all off, which is what you should do. Yeah. And I just didn't I was just uh you know, rookie moves, just getting letting the whole thing affect what I do, you know, the, what I do well, and I just didn't do it. And it was, and I let it get to me. And I, and yeah. I, so I, I walked not, and not in an angry fuck you people. I was just like, this is silly. Yeah. This, let's, I'll leave and you guys can, yeah, do the, get to the stuff you like. It's fine. It's not, no, no hurt feelings. Just, Isn't you know. that interesting about stand up? How if you're in your head, you're just fucked. Yeah. You know, it, it has to be, yeah. You know, it has to be an emotional experience. Yeah. You know? uh, and and there's some times that just say, okay. Uh and that's the only time I can think of where I where I left. Um and I've had plenty of sets where uh I'm like, look, I'm contractually obligated to be here for 45 minutes so i'm going to be here for 45 minutes whether you like it or not i'm gonna do my stuff um i'm not going anywhere you can't boo me off you can't nothing you say or do is going to make me get off stage so i'm going to be here and uh uh at one there's one gig where i just turned my back and i was uh talking into the curtain it was a big it was at the apollo theater in harlem really yeah and i was like i have to be here guys (laughs) You can enjoy it or not. It's fine. You can yell too, whatever. Yeah. But I'm not going anywhere because I got to get paid. Yeah. So this is my job. I'm gonna do it, and you know. Uh, and you turned your back. I turned my back at one point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I turned around again eventually. <laughs> and there were enough. There were a handful of people that were kind of like, "No, we love you." Yeah. You know, that kind of helped, but it was not a good situation. Yeah. But uh, that's the that's the only time I could think of leaving a set was at the comedy festival that says a lot because i know the gigs that we did in boston you know you (laughs) certainly faced (laughs) fights break out oh yeah people heckle i mean the the i had a security guard quit on the last tour um that was in uh, uh pittsburgh outside of pittsburgh great uh uh, it's a theater. It's part of Carnegie Mellon. It's a little outside. It's I want to say it starts with an H. The town. It's part of Pittsburgh. Is this ringing a bell? I don't know Pittsburgh very well. Great room, really. Yeah. I've I've really I've done it a couple times. It's great. Great audience. Nice room. It's, you know, smaller theater. Maybe yeah. Maybe a thousand seats, something like that. Yeah. And uh, uh, Holman. I want to say Holman. Center, Hoburn, something like that. Anyway, uh, and I played the room a couple times and enjoyed it. And I was having a good set. And, uh, you know, some theater, some, whether you ask for it or not, they just put security there. Yeah. They're just there. Um, and there were two guys on either side of the stage, you know, little pit area there with a black windbreaker with white security and block letters in the back. And... 
and the, my sets are designed so that I kind of ease into the harder stuff, you know, right. and I'd like to keep it kind of relatively light in the beginning. And I did, and I'm, you know, easily 20 minutes into the set. And then I s start what's going to be like a 30 minute chunk about Trump and conservatives and whatever it is. Um, and I was maybe 90 seconds into it. <laughs> And uh, and this guy, the security guy, stage left down here, is like, um, this is fucking bullshit. I quit. Oh, and he, shit. he rips off his jacket and he throws it down. Uh, and he stomps up the aisle. Yeah. And the, where it fell in what I was saying at the exact moment, it really felt like a plant, which I've had. I've done before. I've gone out and had plants in the audience yeah. and stuff. And it felt, and people didn't believe for a good couple of minutes that he wasn't a fake guy who was going to come that this wasn't going to be revealed as a yeah, fake thing. Yeah. and you could see him the best part was so he walks up angrily walks uh -huh. up the aisle and he gets to the oops, sorry gets to the back uh the doors out to the the hall and the theater which are backlit right because it's all dark in here and they open up and there's this big stream of light and then they slowly close behind them and you see him just it's like <laughs> You know, his, uh, you can't hear him, but he's like gesticulating, like fucking, yeah. like, he's pointing, and it felt like this is clearly a choreographed bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. And right. It wasn't at all. But, That's great. Yeah. yeah, I remember Pat Oswalt was in Pittsburgh once, and they scared him so much that he had to hide backstage for like an hour, oh. and they wouldn't leave. I, I've, uh, I had a uh, two tours ago, the Making America Great Again tour. That's where I got the most. I would walk outs almost every night. I had people yelling, screaming. Uh, often they, they quietly walked out, but I'd say a third of the time they're like, fuck you, motherfucker. Somebody threw something. It was in Tampa Bay, and a crazy lady threw a beer at me. And um, Shit happened a lot on that tour, but I had a signal uh, with my tour manager that if I, I had two different beers on my rider. I had a like Pilsner and a lager. And if I asked for whatever the other beer i asked for a specific beer if i said hey can he get me a sam adams um that meant get my stuff out of the green room have it put it on a chair have it ready to go uh have the back door ready to go there's no encore i'm bolting out of here keep the light we had the whole thing choreographed keep yeah. the lights going um as if i'm gonna return and and I'm getting the fuck out, and I would run to the tour bus, or I'd run to the hotel, like run, yeah, run. like it was that kind of. What's the you know. closest you ever came to somebody putting hands on you? Um, this wasn't really. Uh, it was this. I was uh, in Baton Rouge, and I was. Uh, um, I've had people throw things at the at the old stitches, the first stitches. I had somebody throw a fucking solid glass ashtray that was back when they were smoking yeah um uh but i had a guy it was like the bunch of frat brothers and i can't remember what i was talking about but this guy just stood up literally stood up and just did this thing and if for those of you at, in your car or whatever i'm uh you know cup one hand is cup the other is a fist and i'm punching it yeah this guy stood up with his big, you know, there's got to be 12 of them. Yeah. And it was one of those things where they papered the room, and it was like, uh -huh. what I, don't, I can't remember what college is in uh, Baton Rouge, but it was, uh, yeah, it was like frat night or whatever. Yeah. And this guy, and he was like, we're, you know, I was scared. Yeah. I was really, because there's nobody who was going to have my back. The uh -huh. club wasn't going to have my back. Right, right. I'm like, I'm going to get the shit kicked out of me, I, you know. And I, did, I think I hid. I probably yeah. stayed much longer than it would have yeah sometimes you get to a club and you see the door guy and he's like 78 skinny and you're like hey you know shit happens at comedy clubs you yeah. actually have to hire big strong people just in case i've had i've had security have to hold people back uh, yeah tom sawyer at the uh remember him at the Cobbs yeah. comedy club in san francisco yeah sure he once stood up there was a it, there was some gangbangers in the back and oh, uh, one of them came at the stage he, he started coming right up and tom fucking john little you're not a big guy no not at all but he's an older yep yeah, threw his know. body into it stopped the guy yeah i got off stage yeah 
All right. Um, what have you turned down recently? Uh, oh, I was going to say, I certainly haven't turned down much, but there was, <laughs> I don't even remember what it was. It was, um, a audio, uh, it was something for a VO, a voiceover. Um, I can't think of enough details to make it interesting, but yeah. it was some voiceover uh, potential gig, which I like doing. Yeah, uh, that I, I think they just wanted way too much. Like for this dumb little thing, this one-off thing. Like I'm not gonna put myself on tape and go into the studio and do this thing for you know uh, whatever it was, so I could go come on down to Dwayne Reed or <laughs> whatever it was. Like if you want me to do it, I'll do it, or I can do it on my phone or right, whatever. Right. But I'm not going i think it was just like fuck this like so it was uh, a commercial for something it was a yeah it was something but it but the, what they wanted was just so egregious and like no no thank you I, i'd rather i mean it wasn't like i was angry or anything it was yeah. like i'd rather go hang out with my kid I don't, yeah you yeah know, yeah i don't need to go into manhattan and lay this track down right you know i remember uh you gave me advice once we were at Luna Lounge in New York, and I was up on stage, and I was talking about how I'd just been offered a Rogaine commercial, uh -huh. <laughs> and then I was really torn about it because, like, you know, I, first of all, I didn't think my hair was falling out, and they they clearly did, and so, uh, and I was like, you know, I don't know how it's gonna look, you know, doing a Rogaine commercial, and and I got off, and you went, you fucking do the commercial yeah. you go you go just it, it gives a shit nobody's gonna judge you for it whatever you know it's you, true and so i did the commercial and, and, and so and the agent said to me don't worry it's gonna run on like espn4 at like three o'clock in the morning during you know girls field hockey so i do it they have a big balding demographic watching girls field hockey at 4 a.m all right maybe maybe men's field <laughs> hockey and so uh and so my tagline on the thing was i look at the bottle and i go so I do it, mm -hmm. I, and I look at the bottom line. I go, I four out of five, I like my chances. <laughs> so cut to March Madness. They mm -hmm. start playing the commercial during March Madness. That must have been big money, it though. Was big money, but I was yeah. also I was walking down the street and guys that I didn't even know were screaming, "Hey, I like my chances!" <laughs> <laughs> Every friend I ever met is calling me up, "Hey, I like my chances." But I'm glad I did it. I got health insurance and I made a, made a bunch of money. There yeah. you go. And it also leads to other things, too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, last R Rogaine question. Rogaine the sequel. Well, it led to this. Because they gave me a lifetime supply and I used it and I, I, I didn't get much results from it. Um, four, four out of five, Greg. I was four the fifth. Four out of five. I was the fifth. Um, last question. What's the hackiest bit you've ever done? Oh, geez. Uh, there are plenty of hacky bits but i the one that jumps out to me is uh an early bit and it was about um i can't remember the exact premise it was about legalizing marijuana and i was like uh i mean there's some things sure you could uh, it's okay if you're high when you are you know a baker or whatever the thing i said was but I don't want my doctor getting high. You go in for surgery, and then the first thing you hear is, and then I would take some water and imitate a bong being yeah. like, <laughs> and then, like, okay. And then it's like a high, quote unquote, high doctor with every dumb cliche trope of confusing and hungry. And like, it was just so <laughs> hacky. It's, it's the definition of hacky. Like you're... But, you know, it's one of those things, like, I was in Boston, and it killed, and when yeah. you, you have to have a handful of things. If you're in the clubs, it's not going well. You yeah. have to have f at least five things going, okay, I can get them back I with call this. I hand grenades. Yeah, you, yeah. Get, you can get, you can just sort of mellow them out for a second, yeah. just so, to, to give you another 25 seconds, yeah. to give you another bit or two yeah. before they turn on you again. So, that was one that was, like, a go-to that everybody it's universal everybody knows what being high is you get hungry and you, yeah. you get you know yeah. childish or whatever <laughs> so that was a real hacky bit That's that i used great. to do yeah all right david cross 
It's always a pleasure. You've been on the Same show here, many yeah. times. It's Thank always you. Good hang, and uh, we encourage my, people to go out and see the tour. Um, all the dates again. I'm sorry. What's the name of your website again? Officialdavidcross.com. Yeah, everything's on there. Okay, and there will be. Don't get upset if your town isn't on there uh, because there's going to be uh, three legs and. We'll, we'll, we're about to announce a second leg. And I know we've got more American dates and Canadian dates on there. And we'll eventually go to Europe and then more American dates. Don't miss it. One of the best stand-up comics in America. hey Hey, now. <laughs> All right. We'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. <laughs>